You don't anticipate, you hear these stories, but you're not, you know, you don't anticipate them necessarily coming to fruition. Next thing I want to tell you about is the Senate. House went on in 1979. The Senate, yeah, not interested. Howard Baker, who, by the way, just so you'll put it in context, go back here to Barbara Price, who introduced me to Best Able at the White House, who hired me in the years 1966 and 67 at the White House. One of the people I met at the White House just hanging was a little tiny guy about my size now, he's five, six, five, seven. He was just hanging around down there in a social event. Nobody knew him. He was a brand new United States Senator from Tennessee. And I went up to him one day and introduced myself, and he said, my name is Howard Baker. Howard Baker, for those of you in the room who are too young, went up to be the majority leader of the Senate, minority leader, chief of staff to Ronald Reagan. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say he didn't like Howard Baker. He was very, very involved in the Watergate hearings, and which he was asking the question, what did he know, and when did he know it, speaking of President Nixon. And Howard Baker today is about 80, 81 years old, lives out in Tennessee most of the time, practices law with our ambassador to Japan. But Howard Baker, I, I didn't ask him directly, but when he was elected majority leader in 1981, dropped in S1, Senate Bill 1, or Senate Resolution 1, which was to televise the Senate of the United States. And because everybody thought he was running for president, and he was, they weren't going to give him what he wanted. And so he couldn't get television passed in the United States Senate. The person that really didn't want it and got up on the floor and said he didn't want it was a man named Senator Bob Byrd. Bob Byrd is the longest serving senator in history. And if he hangs in there long enough, he'll be the longest serving member of Congress either side in the history of our country. He's probably about 89 years old. We had this little newspaper. And in those days, we weren't spending more than a couple million dollars a year. We had a staff of probably about 25. Uh, we had finally gotten some equipment, and we had this little newspaper called the C-SPAN Update. And it was, um, it was uh, something that we thought we could do that might kind of move the process along. We started taking polls every year. A terrific guy named Mike Michelson, who's now retired, he was our executive vice president, would call around to each of the 100 offices on Capitol Hill. And every year would ask, are you for? Senate television? Are you against Senate television? Are you leaning in favor? Or are you leaning against? And we would publish this in our little newspaper. Having no idea who would read it or what would happen, we sent it to every member of Congress. We didn't have that many subscribers to it, a couple, you know, 10, 12,000. And one day I get a call at my desk, and it's a man I'd never met, Senator Bob Byrd, would like to talk to you. He got on the phone and he said, Brian, will you come over and have lunch in my dining room? I read your poll, and I want to know more about that poll, and I want to know whether it's accurate or not. Would you come on over? So I got Mike Michelson, and I said, let's go. We went over to his dining room about 12 noon, left at 2.30. For two and a half hours, I said to Mike, who's a one of I said, Mike, and Mike talks a lot. I said, Mike, put a sock in it. Just sit there, and we're going to listen. And so we sat there for literally two and a half hours and listened to Bob Bird talk. And he does it on the Senate floor. <laughs> uh, his message to me at the time was, I'm now in favor of televising the Senate. And I said, why? And he said, well, I got to tell you, I saw C-SPAN the other day in a hotel where I was staying. And I was very much intrigued by what I saw. And we, we have a mission, and I brought along a little and we put out the mission statements in there, we'll pass it out to you. But our mission is basically to let the public see for themselves Senate House hearings, speeches, uh, call-in shows, all that. But our attitude is for us to stay out of the way and let the public be involved. And uh, he said, I like what I saw. I was watching some speeches there. He said, I really like that. You let people talk, don't you? You know, most of us, Senator, we, that's our whole mission. And he said, well, I, I got to tell you, he said, I, I go back to my state all the time, West Virginia, 
And he said the other night, that one of the things that really disturbed me, he says, I was introduced, and yeah, this guy's been around for, I think he's going into his ninth term if he wins this fall. Uh, he said, I was introduced as the Speaker of the House, Bob Burke. And they thought he looked like Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House. And he was a senator from West Virginia. And he said, we're losing ground. <laughs> we're losing ground. The Senate's on television every day, and people in my state can watch them. And there are people you know, who aren't paying attention that closely all the time. We're not being seen as much. And what happened was, when, this, when the House went on television, it was real easy for the commercial networks just to grab a speech, a, a 15 second soundbite, and before you knew it, boom, this, they're popping up there every night. And in order to get to the Senate, they had to get out of their seats in the Senate and walk up to the gallery, and they had to have cameras up there and shoot them and send it off. It was a whole different world. I mean, <clears throat> in those days, you could sit down at the CBS, NBC, ABC bureaus and just flip a switch, and it would record the House and Senate, right? You didn't have to go anywhere, so you could get your clips for the evening news. So he literally, in 1985, led the charge. And got it approved, and we went on the air with C-SPAN 2 in 1986, June 2nd. All because, again, of one man. I mean, it doesn't mean, if he couldn't have gotten the votes, it, it wouldn't have mattered. But the one man was, in the Senate, you could stop something. Hard to get it approved, you could stop it. And that was, the, I saw that up close and personal, that he was able to stop all that. And then the other guy that was against it was a man named Russell Long. Some of you may have seen all the King's men in the movies lately. That was his father, and uh, Russell Long's father, Huey Long, and Uncle Russell, uh, Uncle uh, uh, Earl. Uh, but now that was, uh, yeah, that was Huey. Uh, but it doesn't matter. The point is that he talked to him, and he said he went to him, and he said, "Russell, our time is up." Now Russell's time was up. <laughs> Bob Birds was he still there? And Bob Bird has been very effective in his use of the Senate uh, ever since 1986. We're, this is the 20th year. I've got a lot more on the page here, but I'm going to tell you one more, and then we'll, I'll shut her down here, and you can get involved in this, because I want to hear what you're interested in or what your observations might be. The most complicated issue in regulation that I've ever seen uh, is something called muscare. And almost everybody's eyes glaze over when you start to talk about this. But it affected our network more than any other network in the business. And this was something that was forced on the industry by both the Federal Communications Commission and the Congress. And this goes back to the, well, it really started in the 80s, but it goes also back to the early 90s. And what happened was the Congress passed a law that said, all television stations over the air in an area of what they call dominant influence have to be carried by the cable system, whether they're watched or not watched. And so that it, it depended on where you lived as to what stations were carried. And I think one of the most egregious examples was Steubenville, Ohio where this small town dropped both C-SPAN 1 and C-SPAN 2 after this passed and carried four PBS stations. Two out of Pittsburgh, one out of William, West Virginia, and one out of Ohio. So you could get four Barneys in the morning and no C-SPAN. And this is a very contentious issue. We had a big fight with the broadcasting business over this. They thought I was nothing but a poster child for the industry going around doing the industry's bidding, I was going around doing our bidding because I knew we were losing. And this thing was fought in the Supreme Court. We lost twice. Uh, the case was Turner 1 after Ted Turner and Turner 2. I actually thought we were going to win because earlier Congress had decided that things like this industry didn't have to take out the rights and ended up doing it on its own. That's another complicated story. But we lost big time. And in effect, in this case, the Congress of the United States, because it regulated through the FCC over the air broadcasting, wanted to protect them. And you'd have strange things like Alan Aguero in New Mexico having to bring in a religious station from Roswell, New Mexico, 200 miles away, because it was in the area of dominant influence, which is another story for another day. 
But these little things, they, they didn't intend to hurt us. We told them, if you do this, you're going to hurt them. And they said, oh, no, we're not. But when all was said and done after the Muscari Law was passed and it was not able to be overturned in the, in the Supreme Court, we lost somewhere in the order of 10 million homes to some part of Caesar. And we're still not back in some areas. Uh, because again, it's the M-O-N-E-Y. We do not make money for anybody. If you're sitting out in the middle of nowhere and you've got a requirement to bring so much money into the cable system, and you look at our channel and we say, we're not mandated, we don't want to be mandated by the Congress. We don't cost them very much. We cost them about a nickel a month per subscriber. But in the end, they look at that and say, I need that channel back, and I'm not about to give up the sports channel or whatever it is, so we lost. Now, nobody in Congress had ever admit to wanting to do this to hurt us, but that's what happens in this game, in this town, where money is everything. Uh, you would think a public service would be able to survive this, but we don't want what so many other people in our business want. They want guaranteed coverage. I don't personally agree with that. I think that the marketplace ought to decide, and, and the broadcasters have a right to be carried if it's a channel four here, but why should some channel be brought in from Wheeling, West Virginia, because it's in an area of dominant influence? I can go on, but I won't bore you with any more of this. Um, that's the background of some of the regulation that we've lived with, and there are some other stories, but why don't I open it up to you and see if anybody is interested in any aspect of this that I didn't talk about. Yes, sir. Uh, early on in uh, C-SPAN's history, were you ever tempted to bring in advertising? We did. We brought in what called something called underwriting. People in public television know that very well. It didn't work. It was not a good idea. One of our board members thought this might be a way for us to generate more money. We ended up generating $400,000 a year from 18 different underwriters, and six of them were the telephone company. So in effect, what had happened was the cable industry was letting people underwrite at a very low amount of money and getting a lot of, of uh, underwriting spots. And six telephone companies that they were in competition with at the time were getting all the credit. And eventually I said, you know, you guys really want to keep this up. There's no reason for us to be, um, you know, making it easy for the telephone companies to get advertising on here. When you want, I mean, the one thing you want out of this, it seems to me, is credit for doing some philanthropic operation like this. And so finally, cooler heads prevailed and got out of that business. Yes, sir. What was that? I don't even remember. I just, it's been so far back, I don't even want to remember it. It was so, it was such a big mistake. Because we had a guy that was selling the time, and he drove me crazy because he was a salesman and he didn't care about this man and all that. Yes, sir. Uh, Terry, uh, I, 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 I agree with what you said. I'm a big admirer, certainly, of C SPAN and also your approach to these issues. That it's great that we have a lot of new media with different voices. But there are some scholars like Cass Sunstein who say, well, the problem with this is that now that you have all these choices where right-wingers only watch right-wing media and left-wingers only watch left-wing media and so on. And so people will no longer be exposed to opposing points of view. And I, I wonder what's your take on that kind of argument. I guess that you probably uh, heard these kind of complaints before. Jerry, is that somewhere in the First Amendment that you can you have to listen to both sides? Have you, have you ever found that in the Constitution? <laughs> Not lately, no. yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't know much about uh, Mr. Sunstein's point of view on that particular thing, but I can tell you that I've devoted my life to the idea that we ought to be able to hear and listen to whatever we want to hear and listen to, read whatever we want to read, and not be dictated to by just because we don't like a left winger or a right winger. I am absorbed in left wingers and right wingers. I listen every day to all these characters. I'll listen to Limbaugh in the afternoon and a, a Randy Rhodes at night, and I love hearing all the different points of view. And you have a right, it seems to me, in this country not to have something shoved down your throat by people that want to believe that, it, that we all ought to get together around the television set every night and think the same thoughts and hear the same news. And I've never understood why people get their shorts in a knot uh, over the fact that Fox News is, is a conservative operation. Let people have it. You've got the other side, let them have that side and stop worrying about it. And don't. The idea that it's hurting our country is baloney. We, the country was founded on the idea that you could hear every point of view. Well, that's what Thomas Paine was all about. And uh, we got to the point, I mean, 
One of the most ludicrous things that ever happened in this country, in my opinion, was something called the Fairness Doctrine. It was 